welcome to our show. I'm your host, Melissa Ridgen. Global warming and climate change are now outdated terms. They've been replaced by words with much more urgency for the catastrophe that's waiting to happen. There is no longer any credible science to suggest that human activity isn't harming this planet. We've, we've moved past that. Yet we still haven't actually acted on what we all know now know. So today we're putting the climate crisis in focus. We're not just blaming politicians for inaction and we're not blaming biz business for the destruction because we as consumers, we all have a hand in what's been done to this planet. Uh, you know, global markets respond to consumer demands and we consumers demand a lot. We demand all of this stuff. We want it as cheap as possible. And then we want to sit around and hand ring about how the toll that uh, what we're doing is actually someone else's fault on this planet. Like I'm looking at you, China. Yes, we all know that China uh, is a giant polluter, but China is a big polluter because of what we demand of China. So, uh, you know, we, we need to stop making uh, these demands for all this cheap stuff. The science is basically unanimous. According to NASA, 97% of scientists now believe the climate warming trend in the past century is largely due to human activity. The lifestyles that we've become accustomed to for generations, we need to change the way that we live, and it has to happen now. This is a call-in show. Of course, we love to hear what our viewers have to say. What are you doing to live cleaner and greener? What are your thoughts on how this issue has been fumbled for decades upon decades by business and political leaders? How uh, we as consumers have fumbled this? Uh, you know, I think we can all look back at some of our habits over our lifetime and go, Oof, yeah. We want you to join in our conversations. You can call us toll free, of course, at 1-877-647-2786. You can also tweet us at APTN and Focus. You can comment on our Facebook Live feed as well. So last month, 11,000 scientists banded together to issue a dire warning that we are heading to a catastrophe and enough time has been spent on whether or not climate change is real or imagined or if it's natural or if it's man-made. The Alliance of World Scientists said that human activity, our lifestyles, has in fact accelerated the heating of our planet and if we don't change how we live, there will be climate refugees leaving parts of the world that will become uninhabitable. uninhabitable. Here's an excerpt from a report that they published in the Journal of Bioscience. Despite 40 years of global climate negotiations, with few exceptions, we have, had, we have largely failed to address this predicament. Especially worrisome are potential irreversible climate tipping points. These climate chain reactions could cause significant disruptions to ecosystems, society and economies, potentially making large areas of Earth uninhabitable. And they put this on YouTube hoping to make this kind of complex crisis a little more simple for everybody to understand. Take a look. Based on rising global surface temperatures and increases in greenhouse gas emissions, it is clear we have a climate emergency. Over 11,000 scientists from over 150 countries agree and have supported our recent publication in Bioscience. We suggest six critical steps to tackle the climate emergency. This includes replacing fossil fuels with renewables, reducing climate pollutants such as methane and carbon, protecting and restoring our ecosystems. This means stopping land clearing, reducing meat consumption, moving away from an interest in improving GDP and looking at human health and well-being instead, and also slowing down and stabilizing human population growth. The best news is that there is still time for people, policymakers, and the business community to make the necessary changes to ensure that future generations can enjoy living on planet Earth our only home. The climate crisis is the focus of a five-part series by Northwest Territories video journalist for APTN, Charlotte Moritz Jacobs, who tackled the matter from a northern youth perspective. Youth had gathered in Beaufort Delta, Northwest Territories, to lament climate change that they can literally see happening out their front windows and how they cope with this grim reality. The five-part series airs all week on APTN National News. Charlotte joins me now from our Yellowknife Bureau. Charlotte, thanks for being here, sharing with us uh, all the work that you put into this five-part series. We've seen a couple parts so far, Monday, Tuesday. We look forward to the one that we're going to see tonight. You spent a lot of time on the road for this series. What piqued your interest in it? Yes, Melissa. Um, so after attending a few Dene National Assemblies, uh, I would hear leadership talk specifically about the problems of climate change, but there was never any youth representation. Mm -hmm. um, I've noticed in the last few years with more climate change scientists coming up from the south to the north, uh, they're partnering with NGOs, especially indigenous NGOs. Um, so when I found out about Ecology North, which is a not-for-profit out of Yellowknife, mm -hmm. uh, them going up to the Beaufort Delta, 
uh, I jumped on the opportunity to see youth meet with uh, leadership and elders and climate change experts uh, and also come out of a week-long summit where they had to produce a project that they could bring back to their communities to also teach about climate change. So down south, it seems that younger people seem to grasp what we're doing to our planet. Uh, you know, there's angry eco-strikes demanding that grown-ups act to fix this, uh, but there's a lot of older people who remain, they just believe that this, it's, they believe in this old kind of outdated science that it's a naturally occurring warming and that we have nothing to, do, have done nothing to exacerbate it. I'm curious if you see, if there's a, a young people elder divide of that sort in the north or not, or if people are more uh, on the same side. I would say in the north, um, most people are on board, both elders and youth. Mm -hmm. uh, elders that I spoke with in Tuktaak Tuk uh, said that they are unable to now even predict weather patterns, which was something they were always able to do in the past. Um, when it comes to youth in the perspective mm -hmm. series, uh, people like Ethan Ayakpo from Gamati uh, spoke to me about uh, the decline of caribou in the Klicho region. Uh, these are very tangible things they're seeing. Ananda Canadian from Jete, or yeah, Jete Quay, mm -hmm. um, she had told me about her father this past year uh, going out on the day show and not being able to harvest as many geese. These are reasons because of climate change. These are things that they're seeing, like uh, declining ice, um, shorter ice road seasons, mm -hmm. food sustainability issues. And these are all very tangible things that you cannot argue against. Uh, both young and old people are speaking out about. I love it. OK, well, we've been talking about your series. Let's take a look at part one uh, from the five-part series. I'm scared. For other people and myself, I don't want to do something that's like that'll hurt the land, you know, and make it happen faster. I want to be able to kind of like help heal the land. Each want to learn how they can adapt and inspire youth and leaders to form solutions for a changing landscape. Like lately, I've been always hearing like climate change, this climate change, that is because climate change, like, and. Like it's been such a big topic now and in my own community and a lot with like um, the water and um, on the land has changed. Um, so I, I really want you to be inquisitive and, and curious. And, and not it's a lot to take in. Questions. Scientists have confirmed that the Arctic is heating twice as fast as the global average. As sea ice and permafrost melt, it's become an all out war on the vulnerable ecosystems and the consequences are being felt worldwide. Like as a geologist, we were taught that climate change happens naturally, but that's over millions of years. And the rate that's going at is, a lot of it's to do with us. Are we actually doing enough or taking the initiative to talk about it and to do, and to take action about climate change? Some great work there, Charlotte. I'm curious what, I mean, it's depressing to watch, just even a, a snippet of this. I can only imagine living with this, um, this reality every day. What's the, the kind of emotional or the mental toll that this climate reality has had on people living in the North? Um, so ecological grief is uh, both a scientific term and a lived experience for youth in the North. Um, you notice it in the language that they used, uh, including, you know, I'm terrified, I'm scared, um, not just for themselves, but for future generations. Um, I think part of this series and part of the summit really was not just talking doom and gloom, but solution-based um, sort of action towards things. Mm -hmm. uh, you spoke earlier on that it's, it's going to be a tragedy of the commons that we can't just keep blaming other people and saying, oh, well, it's big business. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, not something that I heard from youth. I was expecting to hear more, you know, it's the diamond mines, it's the GNWT that aren't acting. Mm -hmm. And a lot of youth, when I spoke with them, they, they said, yes, this is, this is awful, but I've already made uh, sanctions in my own life to live greener, to uh, not buy fast fashion. Um, to look at my carbon footprint. You've seen it with youth rallies everywhere where, yes, um, the posters say that youth are, they're angry, they're scared, they're sad, um, but they're also hopeful that already with uh, working with climate change scientists and with elders that they'll be able to uh, delay the, the speed that climate change is hitting. Um, what sticks with you as a reporter from doing this story, this series? 
I think what sticks with me is already seeing the action that some of the youth from the Perspective series have taken on. Uh, Hannah Tanaton from Toledo in the Satu region of the NWT. Uh, she was able to hit the ground running after uh, we workshopped one of her projects on the last day I was filming. Mm -hmm. uh, and she had wanted to bring youth out on the land from uh, the Satu and uh, do healing camps, uh, talk about traditional medicines, talk about uh, climate change, um, and really introduce, because she did not have a very good base level knowledge, the same as a lot of us, mm -hmm. did not have much base level knowledge on what's the difference between global warming and climate change. Yeah. So with this summit, she was able to learn how to bring this back to her community, and she already has. So to see um, youth already going out there and being the leaders in their own community teaching this, that's, that's incredible. Well, and this is additional stories for you to cover as, uh, they, as they implement these plans that they had when they were at the summit. Charlotte, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks, Melissa. So we look more forward to seeing more of Charlotte's work in the coming days. It's Wednesday. We've got uh, one on APTN News tonight, tomorrow, and Friday. So we're going to go now to Jesse Andrushko with some of your comments on the climate crisis. Thanks, Melissa. This week online, we wanted to hear how climate change is affecting your community. On Facebook, Mary Noel said, less and less bees here in Montreal during summer. Mm -hmm. From Christopher, our homeless population in, in Fort McMurray is full of people who had to leave their home communities. Water is poison, the wild meat is blighted. Ed said, I have a maple syrup record on the wall of my 130-year-old log sugar shack. The dates and the quality show that there is no dramatic swing. I guess nobody told my trees that things have gone all to hell. Kelly said, a few possibilities in Ontario, increased precipitation, frequency of ice storms, increased average temperatures, and flooding. And lastly from Jeremiah, speak to your elders. They'll tell you how things have changed. The younger generation is too privileged to listen and refuses to accept what cannot be seen. Later in the show, we will take a look at more of your comments, including some people who don't believe there's a climate crisis. If you'd like to join our conversation on climate change, here's how. Join our conversation now. Call in toll-free at 1-877-647-2786. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN in Focus, Or send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. Thanks so much, Jesse, for those comments. Some interesting ones in there. Uh, if you want to see the first two parts of Charlotte's series on climate change from a northern youth perspective, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca slash climate change, or you can visit APTN National News Facebook page. Uh, the rest of the series, as I would said, is going to air each night this week on your APTN National News. Okay, we have to take a quick break, but when we come back... A youth from the Yukon shares her fight for climate action and is featured in Charlotte Morat Jacobs' climate series Thursday. Stay with us. I remember when I was six. Uh, up in the Welcome back. We've got more of your comments on today's climate change topic. Let's hear from, again, our social media editor, Jesse Andrushko, with some of what you guys had to say. Thanks, Melissa. Before the break, we read some of your comments from Facebook about the changes people are seeing in their communities. But we also heard from people who don't think there is a climate crisis. Here's what they had to say. From Charles, climate change is a natural occurrence. They find living settlements below sea level, ice age, and up high in the mountains, earth warmed up. People always move besides the water. Takaro said, no such thing as the climate crisis. Life goes on. Daryl commented, this is propaganda. Petro said, Mother Earth has her ways. Get used to it. In another 500 years, they will blame the Ice Age on our failure to stop global warming. Wake up. Len said, Many young people believe it is blown out of proportion as well. Why is it that some people just attack and insult their elders but are afraid to do the same with those your own age? Odd. From David, it is colder now because it is wintertime and during the summer it was really hot because it was summertime. All is natural, I would say. If you'd like to add your opinion to our topic of conversation, here's how. 
Join our conversation now. Call in toll-free at 1-877-647-2786. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN in Focus. Or send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. Thanks again to all of you who took time to comment and for Jesse reading them to us. Thanks. Okay, so we're uh, joining us now from Whitehorse is Mariah McDonald, who is uh, from Haynes Junction, Yukon. She's living in Whitehorse while she goes to school. She's one of the youths that was featured in uh, Charlotte Moore Jacobs' five-part series on climate change from a northern youth perspective. And joining me in studio is Cheyenne Ironman. She's from the Center for Indigenous Environmental Resources. Uh, she's a research associate working with indigenous communities coping with a changing environments and also helping communities live more sustainably. Thank you guys both for joining us. Uh, so I wanted to. I'm gonna. I want to get to both of my guests here, but we have a caller here too that I'm gonna see. Hello, Vanessa. Is, hello. Is is Norman on the line from Calloway? Yes. Hey, Norman. Thanks for calling in. I'm curious to as to your perspective of this. Uh, you're a lifelong resident of Calloway. What's your thoughts on the climate change, climate crisis? Yeah, we are focus on our climate too in our area have you noticed anything have you noticed change happening over the course of your life how, how old are you yeah I'm I'm 40 now and I'm originally from Pingnatung oh. and when I was younger we used to go um, fishing on sea ice in June, mm -hmm. and in the last good 25 years, we haven't done that wow. <laughs> or able to go fishing on ice due to climate change. Is but I'm curious, do you, is there is there conversations being had like this is just a naturally occurring thing that the the Earth goes in cycles, or is there a belief that human activity has caused this what's the conversation that you guys have well as myself we always follow our tradition too when it comes to climate and we always fo follow what's happening mm -hmm. within the time being so for me I can't really say why but I believe it's the cycle for a long term years and from my grandfather um, I recommend their word and the people of the land that they know of about our land and climate so sometimes when I hear the polar bears are in danger but a lot of times when i out there, I don't see them, they're in danger, but I believe we have more, more than usual. Do you believe that when there's more than there, usual or, you're, or they're just closer to where people are so, you, so people see them more? Because I've heard arguments for both yeah. sides that there's actually a, a decreased yeah. number of polar bears, but then I've also heard well, people are saying that they see them more often. Well, it's because they're... Uh, you know, in places where humans live now, they because they're they're not out on the ice anymore because the ice is gone. So, which do you know which it is? Well, I can't really answer that. But when when a hunter where we live and harvest polar bear for our meal, and it's always a story that they caught it in ice or either in the water because mm -hmm. a lot of times we'll try and harvest them during the best time of the year seasonally and there's differences in west what we hear that they're closer to people mm -hmm. but in our area in east of Nunavut it's common that we we rarely see them maybe once a year twice a year in my in my knowledge anyway Thank you. Well, Norman, thanks for calling and sharing that with us. 
Um, I want to ask each of our guests here, Cheyenne and uh, Mariah. I want to, we'll go to Mariah first because you're further away. Um, when did it register with you that uh, the climate was something that is worthy of your attention? Do you remember, was there a moment? Um, I think in 2017, when I was 17 and those hurricanes were happening in around August. And you, there's some, you've seen some of these changes literally outside of your... And I remember hearing that. It Sorry, we've got a delay here that's mm -hmm. always a pain in the butt. Um, what are some of the things that you've seen out your front window, literally yes. in your lifetime, in your community? You're from Haynes Junction originally, you're living in, in Whitehorse. Um, share with us some of the things that you've experienced over the course of your life, the changes. Um, well, recently it's been getting warmer and warmer uh, uh, outside during the winter times, and even in the summertime, I noticed that it's getting hotter and hotter. Um, just right now in Whitehorse, it's just yesterday, I think, in Whitehorse, it was around minus two. Uh, so Cheyenne, I'm going to ask you the same thing. What, at what point did you uh, realize this was something that you were, that your generation was going to be dealing with and was something that you thought this would be worthy of your time and energy? Um, well, <laughs> sorry. Um, I actually didn't get into environmental work on purpose. It was actually an accident, not an accident, mm -hmm. but it, it wasn't something that I had planned for. Um, so I didn't really um, think too much or have much awareness of climate change until I actually got into the work. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until um, I started talking to elders more regularly that I realized that there's um, quite a, a disconnection between how elders see climate change versus youth. Um, I mean, there are a lot of youth that understand that this is a really big issue. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there's a lot of youth that I don't think see how urgent it is or as much as the elders do. Interesting, because we hear a lot that it's the opposite, right? We hear that the youth are so <laughs> woke and they know what's going on and they want to save the planet and they have all the answers and it's these old people that wrecked the planet, us oldies, trashed the place and have left a legacy of a mess. <laughs> and you're saying that that's not necessarily always true. Some, tell me some of the things that you've heard from elders. Um, some things that we've heard. Um, the animals are changing their behavior. Um, it's, they're becoming a lot less predictable. Mm. Um, a lot of them, like you said earlier, are straying from their natural habitats and coming into, or coming in closer to where people are. Mm. Um, weather is becoming um, harder to predict. Mm. So um, a lot of traditional methods of predicting the weather are beginning to fail us now. We, they're not um, as reliable as they once were. And is there a feeling that this is just a naturally occurring cycle of the earth, or do these elders feel that this is because of how humans live on this planet now? I've definitely heard both sides of this argument. Yeah. So there's no doubt that this is happening. This is like 97% of scientists do believe that climate change is happening and it is a part of a natural cycle but um, what humans are doing is is causing it to go a lot faster than what we've seen naturally in, in the past. Uh, Mariah, I'll go back to you. What is the most frustrating thing for you uh, in the midst of this the climate change, I guess the debate or the lack of the debate now, it seems like we've kind of moved past the debate for the most part. What's the most frustrating thing for you in terms of watching not enough being done? Um, yeah, it is pretty frustrating watching uh, like anything about climate change and hearing all the debates about climate change and 
um, like there's so much like proof that's there, but some people just don't want to see it, I guess, and it is pretty frustrating. Okay, we've got a caller. Uh, Damon, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, thanks for calling. You had a question or a comment? Yeah, what I'd, uh, I've, I've done a bit of research here. What I'd like to do is quickly present a case that, um, that the current, current theory of climate change being solely a cause of human interaction with our environment. I don't think anybody said that it's solely that I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that. Well, I think that what the well, argument is is that we human activity exacerbates. And there's, there's certainly things that humans do that's damaging to our environment, like yeah. plastic, the levels of plastic in our oceans is a huge problem. Yeah. The pollution of the waterways in, in places like uh, China, it's, it's, it's absolutely terrible, but that's it's not something where the, the evidence doesn't support the idea that CO2 is increases in CO2 is what's causing a warmer climate. And yeah, the, just even recently, the, the figure that 97% of scientists agree that climate change is caused by CO2 level, that was actually debunked by the head of the United Nations panel on climate change, who said it was based on a survey of 77 scientists, and not even 97% of the scientists responded to the survey. So if you look at uh, one, of the, one of the big myths is that CO2, as CO2 levels increase, temperature levels increase at a corresponding rate. But ice core data finds that's actually not true. And the graph that even Al Gore used in his documentary, Inconvenient Truth, if you actually blow up the graph, and take a, a very close look at it, which you can do by going to the, uh, the museum in Regina. Um, they have a giant graph. You'll see that at every documented historical increase in temperature, CO2 levels increase afterwards. And the theory that CO2 levels cause a uh, change in global temperature, that thing entirely falls apart when you take into account the, the uh, medieval warming period, mm. which was from, um, I believe it was 850, to 12, 1200 AD. And what they found is if you go back to the historical records from cultures across the world, you'll see that during that period, there was an increase in prosperity because the, the warmer temperatures allowed greater crop production. They were able to grow vineyards in areas they previously could not, could not grow. Right. Even, even the idea that uh, the sea ice is all melting. There is, there's a lot of evidence that shows that Arctic sea levels are decreasing. However, if you look at Antarctica, you'll find that recently, in just this year, the Antarctic sea level or ice levels have reached an all-time high. They're actually at the at the same levels as they were around the period of 1850 to 1917. So, with all of this information that you've that you've researched here, does, do you feel that that you, do you go well that it's that's just it doesn't matter how I live or how anybody else lives on this planet keep doing what we're doing and the world will just keep doing what it's doing has it is it given you an excuse to not change how we live that's well it, that's I like I get I get the question but it's sort of um, a bit of a skewed skewed way to look at it because one of the things you have to take into consideration is um, in North America, for instance, there is now more more forest in North America than there was in 1850. There's more forest coverage because we now have access to to fuel sources like natural gas that we can use to efficiently heat our homes. We don't have to go and cut down trees. What are your thoughts on using solar or wind to heat our like renewables? Well, the solar. The problem with solar is that every 12, usually every 10 to 12 hours, the sun goes away. Mm -hmm. So solar is only, only active, is only, only produces energy while the sun is out. And currently we don't have the technology to, to But we could, if there was an investment in finding better technology, if we were shifting our investment from propping up the oil industry to propping up solar or wind or renewables. So I guess, yes or no, are you, are you gonna change how you live as, as, as a consumer? 
Well, it's 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 a complicated thing because even solar, solar can be devastating yes no? to the environment because of the materials that are required to make the solar panels. <laughs> you look at the batteries that are required to store energy. Batteries <laughs> are, come from nickel and cobalt mines, which are very very devastating to environments. And cobalt is only mined in the Congo. Okay, we, we gotta go, <laughs> David. We gotta go. We're running out of time here, and I've been ignoring my guests here. But I do appreciate you taking the time to call and you make some interesting points, and that uh, of course is something people can go and uh, look into some of the claims that you made too and see where they, where they sit on it. Um, Cheyenne, I wanna know, do you, uh, I want you to tell us a little bit about what your organization does. Okay, so SEER is the Center for Indigenous Environmental Resources. Yeah. And we're a First Nations directed national nonprofit organization. We partner with communities all across Canada and we work to build or support sustainable communities, mm -hmm. um, building so capacity got, and protecting lands and water. And it's, it's people, it's communities who, who want to change. They want to do things better. That's who comes to you, right? You're not yes. out shopping this around. It's like people, it's communities and, and groups that um, have a desire to change. Yes. Is there a lot of them? Yes, there okay. are a lot of them. Um, we get uh, requests for support all the time. Um, we're developing different resources for communities to access. Um, one of them that we're working on right now is the Indigenous um, Climate Change Adaptation Planning Toolkit. Um, what they're showing on the screen is the Indigenous Climate Hub, which is um, something that SEER provided some content for and it's got tools and resources that communities can access, connect with other communities. Um, these are pictures from Fox Lake Cree Nation, a fishing derby that was held by their climate change coordinator. Um, they did lots of great activities with the community. Um, there they are, they learned how to catch, prepare, and smoke fish, and they had a barbecue, and the youth created posters about what climate change means to them, and a lot of the pictures were very hopeful. Um, the youth, I think when, when you ask the youth what climate change means or what it looks like in the future, mm -hmm. a lot of them are very hopeful, and they have, um, I guess it, it invokes a sense of responsibility in them to protect the land, protect the water and the animals and ecosystems. I love it. Uh, I'm going to say we've got to take another break. Mariah, I'm sorry for the time delay in between us chatting. It was made it a little bit difficult. I want to thank you for taking the time to join us today. And uh, I look forward to Charlotte will be covering some of the exciting things that you uh, guys are launching in uh, Northwest Territories and the Yukon as a result of uh, the Youth Summit up there. So I look forward to seeing some of those things on the news. Thanks for joining us. Yep, thank you. So just last week, a group of youth from Ontario launched a, a lawsuit uh, against uh, that province in Ontario. We are seeing, and actually, no, we're missing something here. Um, we're seeing an increase in these ecocide lawsuits, as they're called. Um, we need to take another break, but when we come back, tips on how to live greener. We'll talk a little bit more about these ecocide lawsuits as well. Stay with us. Audrey Logan is an elder living in Winnipeg who lives her life making as little environmental impact as possible. She'll share with us tips on how we can all do better. Stay with us. When I look at the earth, I look at the earth as that. You know, do I want to slice her open? That's my mother. I'm not going to slice her open, expose her to the sun, sterilize her, not cover her for winter. When you look at it as a living entity that it is, because it is a living entity, then you need to treat it as such. Welcome back. Today we have been discussing the climate crisis and looking at how uh, northern youth are experiencing it. We've also heard from uh, some interesting callers about their take on whether the climate's changing, whether it's man-made or not. 
Joining me in studio now is Audrey Logan. She teaches people in Winnipeg how to uh, garden sustainably, has lots of tips on how we can all live a little greener. And Cheyenne Ironman from the Centre for Indigenous Environmental Resources. They're doing a lot of work helping communities who want to live a greener life. She's going to share some of the, those uh, tips with us later too. But before we get the discussion going again, our Yellowknife reporter uh, for APTN, Charlotte Morat Jacobs, she traveled across the Northwest Territories to find out uh, what signs of climate change people are literally seeing in their backyards. Let's take a look at part three of her five parts climate change series. This is from Tuktoyaktar. Canada's Arctic landmass represents 40% of the country, nearly half of the far north's coastline but less than 0.25% of Canadians live here. How the impacts of southern businesses have impacted the north, because I, we, I don't see it like this back at home, because I'm more like in the middle of the continent, so I'm not as far north as Tuktoyuktuk. And when we went there and I saw like before and after pictures of like the coastline, that just broke my heart, because if the way it keeps going, Tuktoyuktuk is going to be under, underwater soon. And they've had seven storms already, and it's not even storm season. That is a preview of part three of the three uh, five-part uh, climate change series. That, what we just saw, is going to be airing tonight on APTN National News, so make sure to tune into that. So, Audrey, we've been uh, chatting about uh, climate change, whether it's man-made, whether it's not man-made, whether it's naturally occurring, whether what we do is make what's naturally occurring even worse, whether the young people understand the problem, whether they elders understand the problem I'm curious your take um well I pro I asked this to my auntie 35 years ago because that was when a big oil spill happened and I was one of the youth who were terrified of what was coming mm. and um, she said uh, of course things are changing but what we're doing to it is uh, making it worse and she gave me a prediction of what would happen to Fort McMurray and it came true Really? And that was and 35 years? Yeah, 35 years ago. And she said, when my homeland burns, then you all know it's time for change. Fort Bring Murray went up in flames. Yeah. How did she know that? Well, she knew they were draining all the water for the oil sands, so it's common sense. They were draining all well, the, all that the moisture. Well, not that because it, 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 it is, happened, right? Well, <laughs> you know? it's common sense in the sense that you have so many yeah. people denying, yeah. saying, oh, no, it, it's that that isn't what happened yeah when it is you know we depleted our water I mean sure water was more accessible back then but it's not now yeah it's so polluted so to say that we're not affecting the climate because what we didn't find at what 80 kilos worth of plastic in a whale's belly yeah of course we're changing it we're affecting it yeah it, it's now into our food systems where they're finding microplastics not just in the air, in the water, in our fish, mm -hmm. as well as in our vegetables. Yeah. So of course we're changing it. You know, and it's just a matter of how are we going to adapt. Well, and, and are we figuring said. it? Are we figuring it out? Like, does everybody understand that it, it, this isn't somebody else's problem? This isn't China doing this. This is it's us. It's our, especially in North America, it's our lifestyle. Like, we need big giant houses. We fill them with stuff. We have so much yeah. stuff that we have. We need storage containers. Like storage, we just, Cheyenne and I were talking. There was no such thing as a storage unit for the most part. No. You know, when I was growing up. Now everybody has a storage unit for all the crap that we amass. Like we consume so much, and then things are broken, and they we pitch them in the landfill, and we think nothing of it. It's not us polluting the oceans. You know, when we're landlocked here. Mm -hmm. You know, are, I'm curious. Do you guys see that people are understanding this is us? This is it's you, it's me, it's how we live here. Are you, I'll start with you, Cheyenne. Do you? see people getting it? Yeah, I mean that's what we do. We go into communities and we raise awareness about these issues. Um. Yeah. I definitely know that and I find the ones that are deniers are usually ones who don't even go outside other than to go from their car to their house. <laughs> so their opinion really doesn't mean much to me anyway. Natural selection will take care of them, Auntie said. <laughs> I, uh, this was an interesting headline today. So, as I mentioned to our viewers at home, you and we'll get into the sustainable gardening, um, the gardening that you do for um, the food co-ops, the food program here. What's it called? Mm. Foods. Uh, good food club. Good food club. We'll get into that in a bit. But you, uh, as soon as I read this headline today, I'm like, good thing we have Audrey coming on. Food prices expected to jump next year due to climate change, according to a report. This is the Canadian Press reporting this day. The average Canadian family could be paying nearly $500 more. 
uh, for groceries next year. That's according to an annual food price report that highlights climate change is the major culprit in rising food prices because of unexpected snowstorms, droughts, and other weather events that have impacted crops globally. Oh, look at our potato harvest this year. Half of it's still in the ground. Yeah, because of snow. Right. Yeah. Now, if they were able to predict like they used to in the past, they would have been able to lift it out, but they didn't because they weren't expecting. Were we expecting that big dump of snow no, that destroyed so many fruiting trees as well as many other, other environments? Yeah. No. What, um, what's your number one tip to, to people at home who look and go, I don't even know where I'd begin with how I could make a difference? Um, I think just uh, thinking that in the first place, because mm. so many are just choose to be oblivious. Uh, it's a lot easier. It's just like that frog in the pot of boiling water, right? <laughs> <laughs> it waits until it's too hot. Yeah. And usually that's what it takes is something to impact someone personally. Mm. Now, you heard about the food going up for mm -hmm. this coming year. Well, those are based on last year's harvests. So the year next is going to be even worse because that's going to be based on this year. Right. So it's always a year behind. How do you right? eat? How, how do we eat affordably? Like, I, know, I hear a lot of people say, oh, I'd love to go buy organic things and to be responsible, but we can't afford it. Sourcing. Matter of sourcing it. Um, I myself, with the, we have a good food club. Now, it's not just a good food club. What is, matters is what they do. Mm -hmm. They support a farmer by buying a cost share, which means they buy a share in the uh, field. Mm -hmm. And by how much the farmer produces, then that's how much we get as a group. Mm -hmm. And then we sell it at our market. When I first got here to Winnipeg, uh, markets were legal here in Winnipeg. Yeah, blew me away. <laughs> I was like, what? But there again, it took people coming together saying, oh, that's not right, mm -hmm. and making that change. Now we have markets popping up all over. And these could be done, yeah. I mean, anywhere, really. Well, yeah, because the, the Weens Farm, what they did Maybe was they have, uh, they have the, their field, field, and then we have a cost share. We go out and help out once a week out on the farm, mm -hmm. gets our people out, outside the city. And then in the, during the summer, every week, we bring in vegetables and then sell it to our membership. Mm -hmm. And because we sell to our membership, we can sell it at half price and still maintain. But it also helps the farmer. And this is cheaper than yeah. going to the grocery store? Oh, way cheaper. Buy I walked home with a, with a cart full of squash for $3. Right. As for apples, uh, there's tons around this city. Yeah. Um, I, that's where I source most of my, my uh, you fruits. Always, you always come with a bag of dried apples for us. Yes, I do. Audrey and our for Cheyenne, is this, what are we yeah. seeing in, in First Nations communities um, in terms of addressing uh, food uh, shortages, affordable food, healthy food, uh, living, trying to live more and, and eat more sustainably and healthy? Yeah, we're seeing food sovereignty projects pop up all over the place. Um, a lot of the communities that are in colder climates, so even within northern Manitoba, there are communities that are doing vertical gardens. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's important that people get healthy, or healthy food and that's affordable and accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and there's an appetite for this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are, are we seeing it growing enough, though? I think, um, I think we have to get rid of some of the myths of the past, thinking that we can only have one crop a year, um, thinking we can't grow north. Um, Northwest mm -hmm. Territories, Hay River, um, Jackie Milne is running the uh, Northern Institute, Farming Institute, blowing everyone away, using, using regenerative farming. So she's got pigs, chickens, whole, I mean, they just harvested Brussels sprouts about three weeks ago, okay? Yeah. And uh, you know, so we gotta bust these myths that we can't do it. You know, because that's how they get you to come to the store. Right. Right? But our people have been growing all the way up into Thompson. They found squash and pots with seeds, mm -hmm. you know, in the stomach of mammoth. That showed that we had been cultivating food way back. Yeah. 10,000 years. So there's so, no excuse to no. grow it. And it's no. easy. Just put a seed in the ground. It'll do what it needs to do anyway. Creator allows it to do what it needs to so we've got to take a caller here but i i want to get back to the to the gardening because i'm always fascinated by your permaculture mm -hmm. uh we have steve on the line i believe hi 
Hey, Steve, yeah, how are you? Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for, uh, for putting this uh, segment on. Our pleasure. I think one of the things is that uh, society tends to discount the indigenous voice on the ground, like when they're already the elders in the north are talking about climate change, mm -hmm. and uh, no one really takes them seriously unless it's, uh, it's confirmed by white society. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah, right, yeah I'm listening. I'm fascinated. Keep Hello? going. Hello. Oh, you couldn't hear me? No, I can hear you perfectly. You're on, oh, you're on okay. the air right now. Keep going. You're on a roll. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I couldn't hear you. Because <laughs> okay, I was listening so, yeah, intently. Like, we know that, uh, that uh, Indigenous knowledge is dis disconnected. I'll give you a perfect example. Remember the 90s when the hantavirus uh, crisis was on? Yep. Yeah, it was the Navajos that had this prophecy, and the scientific community wouldn't listen to them. But everything he said in the, in the prophecy, because it's prophecy style, they discounted it as folklore. Same thing with, uh, with what we were hearing about the elders talking about uh, how their, foods, their food supply is uh, changing, how the animals' their, uh, behavior is changing. How, now you, see, uh, you saw a hybrid of a, of a grizzly bear and a polar bear. You're seeing uh, there was a polar bear, I think, as, low, as far south as uh, Shimadawa, I believe. You know, so it's changing. Even mm -hmm. in my age, I'm 59, so like, I've seen uh, you know, changes. Like, uh, we used to go picking for plums. You don't see them in the wild very, very rarely. Yeah. You don't see uh, pin cherries. You don't see uh, as much Saskatoons as there was. And you don't, you don't see, uh, like at the, at the shorelines, you don't see those black uh, little minnows, those uh, uh, bullfish minnows anymore. You used to see them in, 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 you know, in the thousands, and now you don't see them at all. Uh, if you could see the, the ground in the shore, but you know, it, just, it just changed. And uh, we are seeing it before our eyes, but it's, it's being discounted. And uh, that fellow that called there, Damon, and he's that uh, climate denier, mm. uh, the UN just came out with a, with a climate report and just saying, you know, like, I'm not going to get into this fast because you can just read it there, but we know, mm. we know because people are on the ground and they see it. They see it with their own eyes, their own mm -hmm. lives. Thanks in for our little bit of system. Thanks you know, the for calling. The clear that happened in our area <laughs> on the east side of uh, Lake Winnipeg. You know, the, the, it looks good when you're driving up the highway on 304, yeah. but then, you know, you go a little ways, you know, 150 feet into the bush and it's all clear cut. Yeah. So, so you know, like well, everybody's I, seeing it. This is the thing. I mean, it doesn't matter where uh, across this country you're hearing these first-hand accounts. And thanks, Steve, for calling. Uh, it's it's a good point um, uh, that we, we need white science to confirm it. <laughs> but it's exasperating. <laughs> we're running out of time, but I want to ask you guys just bang my bit. Favorite? What uh, the easiest way to reduce uh, an individual's impact on this climate? Go. I'll I'll start. I'll start and then we can go around. Uh, don't buy new clothes. Buy secondhand all the time. I started mm -hmm. buying only secondhand clothes um, three, almost three years ago. Uh, reduce the amount of waste that you produce overall. Um, what, what's going to the landfill? I mean, what can be recycled? What can be repaired? What can be fixed? You know, um, everything that you send to a landfill is going to turn into methane gas and that's going to contribute to climate change. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, it'd be with your food. Um, eat seasonally. Go back to a lot of our traditional ways of processing and uh, storing our foods. Yeah. And then you don't need all these containers and boxes and boxes. Mm -hmm. I take my garbage out once a year. That's amazing. Once a year. Once a year. Okay, yeah. another one, another one of my favorite ones um, would be buy less. Just like stop the gift giving thing. I think that's another easy one. Stop giving. Give, do favors for people instead of having to go to, you know, a big box store and buy stuff, right? Definitely. Here's my Christmas gift to I, you is that I'm going to come I and give, clean your house on Fridays. <laughs> or I give my fruit roll-ups and I yes. give some dried meat or I give gifts of that sort. Because then that, they know that it comes from my personal work as well. Yeah. As well as it supported a farmer or a local person who's making preserves or doing that type I of thing, it. you know. Yeah. We have so much right here locally. There's no reason to buy something from Singapore. Yeah. To be honest. I'm going to give you the last word, Shine. We're almost out of town time here. If people are interested in getting in touch with your organization to have to get help to live more sustainably, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, they can visit our website, uh, www.yourseer.org, and um, we have a lot of amazing resources that are on there. And we're going to be rolling out a new toolkit. Yes. Um, in the springtime, it has three components. It's called the Indigenous Climate Change Adaptation Planning Toolkit. Um, there's the three components. So there's six guidebooks that are being updated. Um, the six guidebooks are um, 
they walk communities through the adaptation planning um, process uh, right from like it, it's for communities that are, are starting off with little to no experience at all with this climate change adaptation so it's a good it starting point walks you through it yes through six steps so there's like starting the planning right. process um, understanding what the impacts of climate change are um, understanding vulnerability and sustainability um, taking adaptive action right. monitoring progress and then um, yeah just monitoring your progress and change we gotta go <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. okay. We are like out of out of time. Um, thanks everybody for sorry. joining us. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Uh, thanks to our guests. Thanks to our callers. Thanks to all of you for watching. And we'll see you back here next Wednesday. Have a great afternoon.